Hi students, this is Mrs. Foy and I'm excited to kind of bring two um, different topics that I wanted to talk to you about, vertebrate evolution and bioenergetics together. Um, and that's what this presentation is about. So I want to back up a little bit and give you just a little bit of the basics of embryonic development. Hopefully we'll have time to cover this later in class, but if we don't, this is just going to give you the basics. So embryonic development starts, of course, with the fertilized egg, which is the zygote. And the first stage of embryonic development, which is basically mitosis, um, is where the cell goes through a bunch of cellular divisions where there is no cytoplasmic growth. So you get a bunch of little cells, basically, and that's called cleavage. Cleavage, um, the end of cleavage stops when um, the embryo is basically a hollow ball of cells, and that is called a blastula. And the, the, uh, the uh, cavity is, is called a blastocele. Seal um, is a cavity. The next stage that happens is an invagination um, into a pore. Almost looks like this is a cross section here, but it almost looks like uh, fingers pushing in like this. And the cells migrate inside to form what is called a gastropore. And that pore is going to be important to differentiate the basic two different types of animals. So we have, as a, as a result of this gastrulation, this invagination of the cells, we have two um, what we call embryonic germ layers that are endoderm and ectoderm, and those are going to be endo is inside and ecto is, is outside. And the arc enteron is the um, primitive gut. You can think of that as a primitive gut. So the two great groups of um, animals in the animal uh, kingdom are protostomes and deuterostomes. So let's just take a look at what that means. So in protostome development, the gastropore, the gastropore, that very first opening, becomes the mouth. So this is a cross-section of the digestive system, and that's where we get protostome or first mouth. That first pore becomes the mouth, and the second one, as it goes through, becomes the anus. This is a tube within a tube body plan, right? And the, the second type of animal, whoops, sorry, the second great type of animal are called the deuterostomes. In a deuterostome development, the, um, at the end of gastrulation where you have the blastopore, that actually becomes the anus. And the mouth develops secondarily. And that's deutero means second, stome is mouth, so deuterostomes. So hold that in your mind. After gastrulation, the next embryonic development is called neurulation. And in neurulation, um, there is the, obviously the development of the nervous system. And in neurulation, um, there is a, a, a flexible cartilage-like material called a notochord in, um, in vertebrate development that actually induces, it influences, the formation of a folding of the embryo to form a tube and that that we call the neural tube and the neural tube um, enlarges at one end of the embryo to become the brain and the tube is the spinal cord so uh, we'll be talking more about notochords in just a minute so in gastrulation, in, um, in, uh, in higher developed animals, um, you are going to have uh, three germ layers. And these germ layers are embryonic tissues that then go on to develop certain body systems. So for example, ectoderm um, goes on to develop the skin of the epidermis, that makes sense the brain, and remember that the, um, the brain and the spinal cord are made in neurulation on the, with the ectoderm tissue on the outside. So that makes sense. So the skin and all the coverings um, and also the brain and the nervous system are made of ectoderm. Endoderm 
is going to be the innermost layer and that is going to develop um, obviously the gut is there the uh, the lung tissue the thyroid tissues and the pancreatic cells kind of some strange um, uh, systems there that you might not think and then the mesoderm or the middle layer is going to develop into our bones and muscles our kidneys our red blood cells and of course um, as we said the gut so um, so the three germ layers endoderm ectoderm and mesoderm so another great differentiation of animals or classification in animals depends on what uh, their what the tissue is around their gut okay so we're looking at a cross-section of three different types of worms but these three worms you might just think a worm is a worm is a worm but they're not worms are very different so this is the most primitive worm which is a flat worm this is a more um, intermediate uh, worm that we call a nematode worm um, and this uh, is uh, that worm notice there's no segmentation segmentation is actually a more advanced body trait and then this would be like a uh, an earthworm uh, an annelid so the difference between these three different types of worms shows us the different types of of what we call acelomate or pseudocelomate or true c or, or uh, pseudocelomate so in the most primitive worm, um, their gut does not have any mesoderm around it. And so there's no body cavity. Um, and so you would ex not expect to see any organs there. So that is an acelomate animal, and that's the most primitive type of worm. In a pseudocelomate animal, um, we do have kind of a, a, of a body space. But the definition of a true coelom or body cavity is that it is completely covered by mesoderm. And so you can see here's the gut that's formed by endoderm. And by the way, this is color coding endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm that you can see with the yellow and the red and the blue. So now you do see a body cavity here, but it's not completely lined with mesoderm. So it is a pseudocelum, it's a false coelom. In the annelids and with all the other animals that are that are have derived from that, you have a true body coelom. So you have that white space there, that's the coelom, that's the body cavity, that's where the organs are going to develop for higher animals. But it is a true body coelom because it is completely lined with mesoderm, and that's that red tissue that you see in the picture there. So if we look at a phylogenetic tree of the animals, now I can use these big fancy words and you can understand what I'm talking about. So in the lower animals from the platyhelminthes, these are the flatworms with the cnidarians in the periphera, these are very um, primitive animals. They are acelomate, no body coelom. And then the nematodes, which are a lot of really cool parasites are in the nematode worms. They are pseudocelomate animals. And then all of the, what we think of as the, the, the great animal um, phylums are all true body coelom. For, so from this branch forward, these guys all have a true body coelom. Now, the two branches that you see here of the coelomate animals are the deuterostomes and the protostomes. So these guys over here, the annelids, the mollusks, and the arthropods, which are going to be the crustacea and the insects and arachnids, the spiders, these guys are all protostomes. So when the blastocele forms, that's their mouth. But the, chord, the chordates, which we are chordates, and the phylum echinoderms, which are starfish and sand dollars, we share the characteristic that we are both deuterostomes. So our blastopore becomes the anus, and then the mouth forms secondarily. So that's pretty interesting, isn't it? So now we can look at what um, the, basically the phylogenetic tree of the chordates. So we can see that the ancestral deuterostomes, here we have a, um, our, this would be our outgroup, right, of our echinoderms. Um, that are uh, deuterostomes but are not chordate. So here we have the development of a notochord. And so all of these 
different groups of organisms we would classify as a chordate. So a chordate, I'll show you a picture in just a second, all chordates have four um, characteristics which we'll talk about. The next big evolutionary development came with the development of a head. And you might not think, well, wow, you know, of course these organisms have heads, but actually um, evolutionary biologists believe that heads evolved um, with a kind of a concentration of sensory, of sensory organs allowed us to, that was actually the beginning of predation. Um, so we have heads and we call those craniates. Then we have the development of a vertebral column. So all vertebrates, and here we have the vertebrates, all vertebrates are chordates, but not all chordates are vertebrates. And that is a development of a bony, flexible backbone to protect the spinal cord. Then we have the development of jaws. So um, we're not talking about uh, necessarily the upper part of the mouth, but actually the jaw. So an opening and closing jaw, that was an, a very important evolutionary development. And those organisms are called nathostome. Stone means mouth, natho means jaw. And then we have the development of the mineralized skeleton. So up until this point, um, the, the, uh, the bones, so to speak, were actually made of cartilage. So sharks and skays and, ray, and uh, rays all have a skeleton, but it's made of, of uh, cartilage. Now for the first time, we have the osteichthyans or the osteichthys, osteo means bone. So now we have a mineralized um, skeleton. Um, the next big evolutionary development was the development of lungs or lung derivatives um, that we see, and this is going to be of uh, important, of course, with the invasion of organisms, uh, animals to land. That was important. And also, other than just um, having lungs develop, we also needed um, four sets of, uh, of uh, appendages. Um, and so this is where we get the development of the lobed fin fishes. They were, these were still fishes, but this was actually a different development of their fins that had a bony structural support, which is different than the ray finned fishes. And the coelacanth, interesting story about the coelacanth um, fishes, they are very important. These guys are basically... Um, living fossils. Um, they were very um, uh, plentiful around the dinosaur age. We thought the coelacanths were actually extinct, but we found one, um, and that's a really, really cool story, um, and you should uh, look at that. I think the book is called A Fish Caught in Time, so uh, I would highly recommend that. And then we had, uh, of course, the development of legs, and those are tetrapods, and then we had the development of the um, amniotic egg. And the amniotic egg was a huge evolutionary development which, which allowed us to not be tied to the water to reproduce as our amphibian cousins are. And then finally we have the development of milk and milk is a, uh, a very wonderful um, uh, evolutionary advantage for mammals who are able to better take care of their, of their young. So these are the four different characteristics of chordates. All chordates have a dorsal hollow nerve cord, um, and that, of course, is the predecessor of our spinal cord. Um, they have a notochord, which, remember, is that thin, flexible rod, kind of a cartilage-like rod, which induces the development of the notochord and neurulation. All chordates also have pharyngeal gill slits, this includes humans. Obviously, we don't have gills. Our gill slits go on to develop other things in our um, throat area. And then all chordates have a muscular post-anal tail, humans included, um, but the, our post-anal tail is lost um, during our development. Um, I wish I had time to talk more about the evolution, but I just wanted to show this picture. Um, this is a, um, a relatively recent fossilized find of our, uh, believed to be our tetrapod ancestor. And um, this was a, a, an aquatic organism, kind of half amphibian, half fish, 
an exciting missing link, so to speak. So it had scales and fins and gills and lungs, like many of our amphibian friends have gills and lungs for breathing in, in, in shallow areas or above ground like a salamander would be. Um, but it also had tetrapod characteristics. And uh, you can see that this development of the thin skeleton has the uh, similar pattern of bones um, that we would have for land vertebrates, so that's exciting. The other very exciting evolutionary development is the amniotic egg. So basically, I tell my students, this is like a, a water balloon around a developing embryo. So when you think about amphibian eggs, they're the jelly um, uh, eggs that, that, that the amphibians, the frogs and salamanders, have to go back to water to lay so that it won't dry out. But with the development of the amniotic egg, which uh, developed in our um, reptile ancestors, um, embryotic development can continue on land. And we, we basically thus had the conquering of terrestrial environments because we didn't have to go back to the water to reproduce. So we have our embryo, embryo here, and then this blue thing right here is the amnion. This is the fluid-filled sac. But we also have some extra embryonic membranes, the allantois, the chorion, and the yolk sac, and the albumin. The albumin on, in a chicken egg would be like the egg white, and together with the, uh, the yolk, that would um, have stored nutrients from the embryo. The chorion is a very important embryo, uh, embryo, extra embryonic membrane that would be involved in gas exchange, so oxygen and CO2 gas exchange. And the allantois is a very important um, extra embryonic membrane for the um, uh, storage of waste from the embryo. Now, in placental, um, uh, animals, placental mammals, these extra embryonic membranes are going to be um, develop into the umbilical cord and which is attached to the placenta. And so these functions then are taken over by the umbilical cord and the um, wonderful exchange that can happen in the placenta of the mother to be able to deliver those things um, to the developing embryo and to be able to take away um, waste. So, um, wish we had more time to talk about it. It's very, very cool. Hey, here are our pharyngeal gill slits that you see here. And um, this segmentation that you see, hey, there's our post anal tail. The segmentation are, are called somites, and those somites develop into muscles and bones. So, now that I've kind of given you a background about animals and animal development, I want to switch to um, energy requirements and how different animals um, have different strategies for survival. So this topic of bioenergetics is the study of the overall flow and transformation of energy in animals. And um, that is going to depend upon the animal size, the, the animal's activity, and the animal's environment. But of course, of course, all animals have to obey the rules of the first and second law of thermodynamics, which says that energy can, can be transformed um, into different types of energy, but that the transfer of energy is always accompanied by a loss of energy to unusable energy. That's our law of, of, um, of entropy, and um, that energy in animals is usually, in living things, is usually lost as heat. So we know that um, animals can harvest chemical energy from food, right? We are heterotrophs, and we use that energy from our food in digestion. That energy is transformed. Um, into the bonds which make up an ATP. And that ATP molecule is going to power all kinds of cellular work, like sodium potassium pumps and muscle contractions. Um, and after, uh, after those needs are met, our cellular needs are met, we can also use ATP molecules to be able to build larger molecules from smaller ones, right? Our anabolic activity. And that also is going to require energy. And the body can also um, 
we need to repair things, we need to grow, we need to have um, cellular mitosis, and we can store um, some of our energy in adipose tissue, which is fat, and then we need some energy to produce gametes. So this slide is a great kind of um, overall picture of the ins and outs of energy. Um, we have our input here, we have some digestion, and that's going to be a transfer of energy from the food energy that we make um, as those molecules are broken down into um, monomers, and so we're going to have some energy lost there. We're also going to have some energy lost in the feces, which is undigested food, remember. Um, so then we've got our nutrient molecules that are in our body cells. They've been absorbed, but as our body is going to utilize those molecules, some of the energy is lost in the nitrogenous waste. That nitrogenous waste is going to end up um, in, in urine. It will be excreted, but we're going to lose some energy there in cellular respiration as we take the nutrient molecules, break them down into um, ATP molecules, which has got some energy trapped. And then we, of course, we can also use um, the the building blocks of the food that we eat to make molecules that we need for our body. That's biosynthesis or anabolism, and we need ATP for use in that. We also need ATP for use for our cellular work, like cell transport and nerve transduction and muscle contractions, and we're going to lose heat there as well. And of course, in the transfer of energy to make those molecules, smaller molecules into bigger molecules, we're going to lose some energy there. So we can quantify our energy use by something called our metabolic rate. And um, usually the unit of energy that we're talking about is a food calorie, which is actu actually a kilocalorie. So when you see that a, you know, an Almond Joy candy bar has 260 calories, that's a food calorie, a capital C calorie, which is also equal to about 4,184 joules. Um, and one way to measure the amount of energy that an animal uses in a unit of time is to either um, measure the amount of oxygen that is consumed or the amount of carbon dioxide that is produced because, of course, both of those are going to be um, gases that are exchanged in cellular metabolism. I wanted to throw this equation up for you. Um, this is an, one of the new equations that the... Um, the new AP Biology exam is going to give you, so you do not have to memorize this, but it's called a temperature coefficient Q. And um, the K here is going to be the metabolic rate at two different temperatures. So this K2 is the metabolic rate at that temperature two, and K1 is going to be the metabolic rate at temperature one. And basically this is saying the, the Q10 is the factor at which the reaction rate increases when the temperature is raised by 10 degrees. So we can talk about this with, with met metabolic rates. We could also talk about a, 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 a temperature coefficient Q10 when we talk about um, like an enzymatic reaction type of thing. So not sure how the new AP biology test will utilize this, but I wanted you to be um, aware of this equation and how it might be used. Again, you will not have to memorize this. You just need to know um, how to use that. So when scientists look at the metabolic rates of, um, of animals, they look at uh, two basic types. Um, the basal metabolic rate is the metabolic rate that an animal who is an endotherm would have at a comfortable temperature. Um, so this would be um, the energy that is required to, um, you know, keep your heart pumping and keep your lungs inflating and uh, basically keep your cells running. The equivalent in an ectotherm would be the standard metabolic rate, which of course is going to be dependent upon the ambient temperature because um, ectotherms don't utilize any of their metabolic rate to keep their internal temperature constant. So both of these rates are going to assume non-growing, fasting, non-stressed animals. And of course, because ectotherms don't have to keep their internal energy, um, they don't have to use any of their, their energy to keep their internal temperature constant, 
they are going to have a much lower metabolic rate. We also know that metabolic rates are also affected by the size and the activity of different organisms. So this is looking at, this graph is looking at the um, relationship of the size of an animal on its basal metabolic rate. And not surprisingly, you can see that the basal metabolic rate is going to increase um, as the body size gets increased. And this is a logarithmic scale, and that's why we get this nice, lovely linear graph. Um, just some numbers to throw out to you. So a, a, a an average male, adult male, human male, would um, have a basal metabolic rate of about 1,600 to 1,800 calories a day, and an average female would utilize 1,300 to 1,500 kilocalories, big C calories per day. An alligator, which would be of approximately the same size as an adult male, is only going to utilize 60 kilocalories a day. So that's like a third of the calories that an adult male would use. And why? Because they don't have to invest the energy needed to keep their internal body temperature constant. Um, this graph over here is interesting. This graph is look, again looking at body size, but it's looking at basal metabolic rate per body mass. So what this is showing us is that a little shrew is going to have a much higher requirement of calories per gram than an elephant would have. So um, a shrew would have about 20 times more calorie per gram of shrew than an elephant would have. And um, interestingly, that that this is the case. So smaller animals' metabolic rates are going to require a higher oxygen delivery. They need much more oxygen because they're going to be um, burning. Their cellular uh, metabolic rate is going to be faster. And consequently, they have to eat much more food um, per, per, for their size than compared to an elephant. So smaller animals um, as the body size decreases, each gram of tissue is going to have an increased energy cost. And as organisms get larger, larger body masses, the energy cost per gram is actually less, but elephants and larger animals are going to have to, to spend more energy on the uh, support of that large body, the locomotion of that large body, and also the delivery systems um, of nutrients and oxygen and, and waste products than would a small. So basically, um, I just explained this slide and um, that's important to be able to compare um, the size of, and the metabolic rate. So animals are going to have different energy budgets. They're going to have, they're going to allocate, just like different households would spend money with different priorities, different animals are going to spend their energy budgets with different priorities. So you look at endotherms, and of course endotherms are going to have a, a piece of the pie of their energy budget um, be um, allocated for thermoregulation. So being able to uh, control our body temperature, um, but but of course in a um, in a small animal there is going to be much more surface to volume ratio because it is small, and so these little guys have to spend much more of their energy budget just to maintain their um, internal temperature regulation um, than would a larger animal. Um, like an adult female. Notice the activity on this penguin. Um, the, their piece of activity is uh, very much higher than ours because they have to work harder to get their food. Um, they've got to swim after fish, of course, and that is going to be a big piece of their pie. In the ectotherms, for example, ectotherms are not like this python, is not going to be required to have any thermoregulation and so their energy allocations are different um, than ours. So um, 
there are two some vocabulary words I want you to know about energy conservation. So one of them is called tupor, and tupor is a physiological state in which the activity is low and the metabolism increases, decreases, sorry, decreases. And that's important because sometimes animals are in situations where they need to be able to save energy um, in order to survive. And um, we know that hibernation is probably the best known long-term tupor that is going to be an adaptation to cold um, and food scarcity. Estivation is, uh, is the name for summer tupor, which allows animals to be able to provide um, either long periods of high temperatures and scarce water supplies. So you would expect desert animals, be, uh, for example, to have this adaptation. Um, to be able to, you know, go into a shady place and be able to just kind of um, be able to uh, uh, shut down a lot of their metabolic demands for their body just to be able to survive. And um, many small birds and, 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 uh, and some, excuse me, small mammals and birds seem to have kind of a daily tupor. Um, and that would make sense because they have, again, such a high metabolic uh, demands on their small bodies. So hopefully um, this has been helpful to you and um, I will see you in class.